from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Nadima Agard on July 12, 2022. Nadima is a Native American artist who has her own business called Red Earth Studio Consulting Productions. Before creating her own consulting and curating business, she had done important work by helping create the Southeastern Native Arts Directory and being the repatriation director for Standing Rock. We talk about these endeavors in the interview. I started the interview by asking Nadima where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I grew up in New York City. My childhood was filled with a lot of interesting people from all over the world. I had a neighbor who was the Japanese war bride. I had a neighbor that was Jamaican woman. There were Italian American neighbors, African American neighbors, Puerto Rican neighbors. Polish and Irish, the MacPhillips family. It was, you know, like a little United Nations, really, you know, growing up in New York. It isn't monocultural. It, you're around people from all over the world. Because of that, I felt that that was my natural habitat. I mean, I don't think I would be super comfortable in a monocultural setting all the time. I lived in East Harlem. It's now called El Barrio. Before the Puerto Rican people came, it was called East Harlem. And then when so many Puerto Ricans came, it became known as the Puerto Rican neighborhood, which is barrio means neighborhood, and they called it El Barrio. Before it was called El Barrio, it was called Spanish Harlem. Mm. East Harlem, Spanish Harlem, El Barrio. So I was born in East Harlem, And then my parents lived in the South Bronx for like a couple of years. And then I went back to East Harlem. And then Inwood is where I live now, Inwood section of northern Manhattan. I had friends who were like, had parents from different parts of the world. I I had a friend whose mother was Irish, his father was Pakistani. I had another friend whose mother was Puerto Rican, his father was from the Danish West Indies. I had another friend whose mother was Puerto Rican and the father was Cuban or vice versa. I forget which parent was what, but all my friends, they were like Mm. half this and half that. Vicky was half Italian, half Jewish. As I said, there was a lot of diversity. Uh, The population was very diverse. I have a friend who's still a friend. Back in those days, people didn't ask people what they were. They made assumptions, you know, and because my friend's mother had a Spanish accent, I assumed she was Puerto Rican, because I only knew Puerto Rican, but it turned out, I found out 50 years later, she wasn't Puerto Rican, she was Cuban. We knew his father was Filipino, but we thought his mother was Puerto Rican, so all those years I thought, oh, they're Puerto Rican Filipinos, Mm -hmm. and it turned out, no, we had a reunion, goes, no, my mother was Cuban and and Native American, I said, you're (laughs) kidding me. People didn't ask each other what they were, you know, they Mm. just didn't do that. It was like very rich, culturally speaking. And what was spiritual life like growing up? My parents were not churchgoers. My parents got separated and divorced eventually, but when they were separated, I went to live with my paternal grandmother, and she was the daughter of a Baptist Sunday school teacher, so... She definitely didn't go to church. (laughs) Mm. But one time we went to a church because there was some reason she had to go. I went to this church for the first time I was in the church. It was the most boring church I ever saw in my life. It was just wooden benches and white walls with a wooden crucifix. And then my Puerto Rican friends all went to the Catholic church. So when I went into the Catholic church, it was like, ooh, it smells the incense, the beautiful colors, it was very seductive. I said to my grandmother, I said, Grandma, can I go to the Catholic Church on Sunday? 
She goes, yeah, sure. So I would go to the Catholic Church and I said, Grandma, can I make my Holy Communion? Yeah, sure. So I made my Holy Communion. Then I made my confirmation. I became Catholic on my own. I chose to be Catholic. One day at Mass, they were saying how people who weren't Catholic were going to go to hell. So I ran home and I said, Grandma, 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 you got to become Catholic mm. or else you're going to go to hell. And she looked at me. She goes, listen, you go to your church and I'll go to mine. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any idea of being forced to participate in a spiritual tradition. You know, like I would see other parents and they would force their kids to go to church because they were Catholic or they were Protestant or they were Jewish or whatever, you know. But my maternal grandmother, I, she never went to church, but they were traditional Cherokee people. They believed that your church is wherever your heart is, you know. So they didn't really go to church. But my grandmother was very devout in reading the Bible, pretty much Old Testament. She would, re, you know, resort to the Old Testament if she felt like people were bothering us and she would pray so that they would leave us alone. My father was Episcopalian. I was christened Episcopalian, never been to an Episcopalian church until I was a grown woman in my 40s. And that was because it was a Native American gentleman who was the priest. Actually, my Jewish friend took me to church and I said, that's a who? He says, well, he says, I think, you know, you should meet this guy because he's really interesting. He says that he's related to your family. So this was in the, when I was living in Minnesota. So I went to the Mazakute church. It's called Iron Door in Lakota. It turned out he was related to me. He was a very nice man. He used to work with a traditional practitioner. He would preach Christianity in the day, and then the Lakota practitioner would have his ceremonies in the basement at night. They worked together, and it was pretty funny because they're, both their names were Floyd. Their last names were Hand and Foot. Virgil Foot and Floyd <laughs> Hand. It's like Hand and Foot. <laughs> and they used to work together. Nadima, what was your spiritual journey that led you to the Baha'i faith? Well, I was pregnant. My husband and I weren't practicing anything particularly, but I was pregnant. I went to the American Indian Center. They were having a fundraiser for Yvonne Wanro, who was a Native American activist. And we were raising money for her. Then someone said there was a woman from the same reservation as my family on my father's side. I went up to her and I said, hi, my name's Nadima Agard. Do you know my family back on Standing Rock Reservation? And she goes, yeah. I says that I've been told that I look like them. And she goes, yeah, you look like them. She was married to an African-American man, which she still is. And they moved to Harlem, and then she moved to Hempstead. And when she came to New York, she didn't know there were any Native Americans. She found there was an Indian center, and she met all these Indians. She was so excited to have all these Indian people. She said, I want everybody to come out to my house in Hempstead, Long Island, for a barbecue, outdoor barbecue, whatever. She invited everybody from the Indian community I was going down the steps at the Indian Center and I said to one of the ladies who was Lakota, also from the same nation, Lakota nation, I said to her, Carol, are you going to Aina's barbecue? She goes, yeah. She says, you know, she's that weird religion. And I said, what weird religion? And she says, she's a Baha'i. I had gotten Seals and Crofts albums and I really loved their music and I read Stuff on the album but I didn't know who they were talking about or they would write stuff about the Baha'i faith but it didn't connect with me until I found out they were Baha'is but I love their music Hummingbird I love that so much when I went to her house I really felt such a calm and centered energy that was 
how our people used to be before, you know, a lot of dysfunction came into our lives and a lot of horrible racism and the abuses, murdering our people through smallpox, infested blankets, real uncivilized behavior of the newcomers that in the Lakota language is washichu which isn't even a white person. It's just someone who takes everything. You know, our people have been damaged, have a lot of dysfunction. So when I found her, I found like her spirit to be very strong and very, very whole and peaceful. The fact that she was married to an African-American guy, that made me feel comfortable because my father's sister was married to an African-American guy. So I felt real comfortable, you know, we had something in common. She introduced me to the faith. What attracted you to it to the point of deciding to become an adherent? I had just read in the 70s, Black Elk Speaks by John Neidhart. I had read that and I really loved it. Along with The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. Those are two very popular 70s books. I really love Black Elk Speaks. And then she came to my house and she said, you know, Black Elk talks about the Baha'i Faith. He talks about the founder of the Baha'i Faith. I said, you're kidding me. So she pointed it out in the book. And I filed that. And then one time I was going on a trip and she came to my apartment with a prayer book. She said, here, take this with you on your trip. I says, okay. I didn't crack it open, but I took it with me on the trip. When I got to Seattle, I had met some people in San Francisco that invited me to stay with them, and they were Native American people that had been on and off the wagon, alcoholic issues. They were trying to clean up their act at this workshop. They were feeling really good, and they were alcohol-free and all of that. And they said, Sister, when you come to visit, come stay with us. And I says, okay. So when I got to Seattle, they met me at the airport, and they took me to the house. And when I got to the house, there was something about the energy in that house. It was not making me feel very comfortable. It wasn't dirty or anything. It just was barren. And I went into the bedroom. Everything was nice and clean, and they fixed everything up for me to spend the night. I took a nap, and then when I woke up from my nap, they went drinking and they came back and they were fighting and they were banging each other up against the wall and I just freaked out and I said oh my god I mean it wasn't like I hadn't seen this behavior before but it was just like I had enough of it I opened the prayer book and I read prayer for assistance right away the phone rang and it was a Baha'i and his name is Lee Brown Lee said Nadima, welcome to Seattle, sister. What are you doing tonight? Would you like to come to a Baha'i gathering called a fireside? And I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. I said, can I bring my luggage? <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to my first Baha'i fireside with Deloria Bighorn and Jacob Bighorn. Uh, I met Loretta King. I mean, these are people that are like so well known now as prominent Baha'is, and here I was blessed to meet Loretta King and another Native sister from Sitka, Alaska, Bobby Charles, her name was. Deloria and Jacob had a little baby girl that was a newborn, and when I walked into the house, the apartment, it was beautiful. The energy was so beautiful. It was visually beautiful. They had a lot of Native American art on the walls. It was just my natural habitat. And I felt very comfortable. And I felt like I had left hell and came to heaven. I went back to New York. And when I went back to New York, some Baha'is that were there, they said, we want to take you to Green Acre. And I said, okay. And they said, we have a surprise for you. I'm not going to tell you who the guest speaker is, but we want you to come. And I says, okay. So I went with my son, who was three years old. 
and we went up to Greenacre, and it turned out that Chester Kahn was the guest speaker. His family is the first Navajo family to become Baha'i. He had a brother named Franklin. So he was very prominent in the indigenous Native believers circle. And he was very sad because he lost his brother, but he said, you know, I'm not an unhappy person, but I'm just sad because, you know, I lost my brother. Later on, you know, those places you put trays in the cafeteria, he had his tray down. I put my tray next to him and I said, I'm so surprised. I never thought I'd see another Native American here. He looked at me for a while, looked right into my heart, and he says, if you love your Indian people, you'll become a Baha'i. And it really was like he shot me in the heart because he knew how much I loved my Indian people. I mean, he knew. He understood how Indian people think. They don't just think for themselves. We think for our community. We have a collective consciousness, you know. Nadima, when did you discover the artist within you? If you're an artist, you're born an artist. My father was an artist. He was a muralist, a portrait artist, and a photographer. And I was around him drawing, and that was sort of a natural thing. I inherited my talent from my father, who was an incredible draftsman. He wasn't much of a colorist. He was like Picasso. He didn't really know colors. So I was making art since I was a little girl. Later, you received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship to write the Southeastern Native Arts Directory. Can you explain the directory for us and your experience creating it? I was working at the Museum of the American Indian. They had a a section of the museum for Southeastern Native artists, but it wasn't that great of a section, and I felt it was underrepresented. And then they took it out to have some other show or something, and So I felt like I needed to represent the Southeastern Native artists more because people focused on Northern Plains and the Southwest. Everything was the Southwest, but the Southeast was kind of overlooked. I got a grant, and I traveled to the Southeastern United States, to all of the Southeastern tribal communities, and interviewed people from each of the communities in North Carolina, I went to South Carolina, I went to Florida, I went to Mississippi, Louisiana. I also went to Oklahoma because although Oklahoma is not in the Southeast, a lot of the Southeastern people were relocated there. So I went to all of those Southeastern states. I did not go to Georgia for some reason. My priorities were with going to Kuala in Cherokee, North Carolina, going to Mississippi, Choctaw. And I went to Virginia, pretty much most of the Southeastern Native communities in the United States. And it was there in the Carolinas that you returned to your maternal ancestral homes and your paternal grandmother's homeland in Virginia. So what was it like for you to return there? It was really powerful. When I was on the plane down to North Carolina, I had a vision of me being in a Cherokee church. I just saw myself in this church. I don't know why I had that vision. The color of the vision was sort of like an orangey color, like burnt orange color, and then I was in this Cherokee church. They were singing Amazing Grace. So when I got down to Kuala, that Sunday I went looking for a church because I wanted to have that experience. I found this one church, and when I went inside, I was kind of disappointed because I couldn't see any Cherokee people, and, and the minister wasn't Cherokee. He was a white man, and I said, okay, I'll just sit here out of respect. But then at the end of the sermon... He called all the Cherokees to stand up, and they stood up, and they started singing Amazing Grace. I started crying. I couldn't stop crying. I just broke out, you know, and this one Cherokee lady just 
grabbed me and, and held me in her arms and said, just give it to the Lord, just give it to the Lord. Her name was Mary. All the Cherokees came over to me and they all embraced me and hugged me and shook my hand. And I couldn't see them because I had so many tears in my eyes. Everything was blurry. And at the end, Mary invited me to her family picnic after church and then I met her son and I got a sense of the people that lived there it felt so good and I understood the energy was very powerful I could feel a lot of medicine energy it felt really good and then my mom came down to visit me during the time and I told her we need to come back to your ancestral homeland mom then she joined me in North Carolina and we went to South Carolina and she just loved it. She goes, I feel so at home. I feel so at home. It was just a beautiful feeling. Also, when I went out to North Dakota, my father's side, I'm Lakota. When I went to Virginia, my grandmother's, my paternal grandmother's family is from Virginia. I thought all those little old Indian ladies, they all looked like my grandma. I says, I didn't know that they, <laughs> they had a certain look. I was like, they all look like my grandma, you know. Hmm. And it was so crazy, but it felt so good to see people that looked like my grandma. I didn't know she had that look. I just knew she was my grandma. So when hmm. I saw all these little, I go, oh, my God, they all look like grandma. It really felt good to go to my ancestral homelands in Virginia, in the Carolinas, and in the Dakotas. And speaking of which, a decade later, you became the repatriation director of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. What did this position entail, and what are some stories you can tell about your work there? My uncle passed away. I, I flew out to North Dakota for his funeral. I didn't have a job, and I didn't have any money, but I know, I just said, I've got to do this. This is really important. I put it on my credit card. I'm going to go. When I came out, I told them I'm going to come for the funeral. They said, well, when you come for the funeral, bring your resume. So then I said, okay. So I brought my resume and I gave it to someone who wanted my resume. And then I came back to New York. My uncle died September. He was very fond of me. He died on my birthday and I thought, they said, don't feel bad. It means that a person really loves you when they die on your birthday. So I took it as that he really loved me. So my uncle passed away, and then I came back to New York. In May of that year, I got a letter with a job description. And it's my resume, except that they removed my name and just written job description so like no one else could have that job. And they asked me if I would take the job, and of course, I was so thrilled to take a job to work for my Lakota people. I went, it was a big pay cut, but it was something I loved doing. And I always took pay cuts to take jobs that I loved doing. I went to Standing Rock, and I was the repatriation director. What I did was mobilize the community to go to different museums, that had objects that belonged to Sitting Bull. So there was a list of museums that had objects that had Sitting Bull's belongings. And according to the NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, according to the NAGPRA, indigenous people from federally recognized tribes had the right to have certain items returned to them if the museum was getting federal funding. So if the museum was getting federal funding, they would have to give back certain objects, funerary objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and human remains. I organized several trips to museums all over the country with a delegation. We went to New England, we went to the Midwest, we went to the West Coast, we went to Washington, D.C. We identified objects that we felt were objects that we wanted to repatriate. Then it was a whole process where we would go through the process of identifying the objects and then requesting those things to be returned. That was the first step. First step was going to the museum with a delegation saying, we want to look at the objects that you have that belong to Sitting Bull, identifying, photographing, documenting on the laptop 
the number of the object, the serial number of the object, photographing it or videotaping. I did that from 95 to 97. I was the repatriation director for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. What was it like to return to your grandfather's Lakota homeland? It felt good. I loved being there. I felt very comfortable. But growing up in New York City, everything is very vertical. It was like New York is vertical and North Dakota was horizontal. It was just like two different worlds. Because I've been in those two different worlds, I feel really balanced because I've experienced both those worlds and they make me really who I am today. Even though I'm not there, I'll always be there in my heart, in the prairies. I'll always carry that with me. I feel that I had to go through all of this to come to where I am today. I had to experience all the different sides of myself and learn learn about them. And speaking of which, you're now the director of Red Earth Studio Consulting Productions in New York City. So what kind of work does this institution do and what is your role as director? It's my own consulting business. I curate exhibitions. I organize events. I produce objects of art. The production part is the fact that I make art. The consulting part is the fact that I consult uh, multicultural and Native American arts consulting. I'm currently the curator of Gallery in the Gazebo, which is an ongoing seven-year volunteer. But it's my community in, in New York City where I live down the street is a a garden that has a gazebo and then we had the bright idea that we would have like an ongoing art show through the summer and fall months, spring, summer and fall until the weather got cold because it's an outdoor gallery. We have a really wonderful show there right now. The volunteers help out because they take the art and they put it up every morning and they take it down every night. I got a grant this year to pay the artists and to pay Ford frames and stuff. And a couple of years ago, I got a grant to have Native American people come to the garden and share culture. My focus right now has been gallery in the gazebo. I also have shows as an artist. And I do presentations on Zoom. Nadima, where can people find your work? Well, they can find my website, nadimaagard.com. That's archival. It's my historical pieces. My current pieces I have posted on my Facebook professional page called Red Earth Studio Consulting Productions. And it shows everything that I've done professionally as a curator, as a presenter, and as an artist. I do presentations that in arts and the humanities. I've been doing a lot of presentations over the years. How would you say that the Baha'i faith has directed your life? There's a great compatibility between the indigenous communities and the Baha'i faith. I feel like the Baha'i faith is like our indigenous teachings on a global level. I've always had the same kind of teachings. I don't think that becoming a Baha'i changed me. It's just that I embrace the community of people that are like-minded because I was told by a very elderly Baha'i at Green Acres that Baha'is are not made, they're found. And I never forgot that. I believe in the teachings of oneness of humanity and all the basic teachings of the faith, and I express those in my work as an artist. And actually, I have done some PowerPoints for the Baha'i community using my artwork to talk about different principles in the faith. So it really, it, it affects my work as an artist. It affects my life. Being a Baha'i is not just a religion. It's a lifestyle. It's a life choice. It's more than just a religion. So just like our native beliefs, our native communities, our native beliefs is a way of life. It's not just our ceremony. It's a way of life. So similarly, Baha'i faith is a way of life for me.
So I live the faith as best as I can, live it being imperfect because nobody's perfect, as best as I can be, as best of a Baha'i that I can be. Nadima, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and your work. I'll post your website on the uh, podcast post and hope people will come and see the work that you've done. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Warren. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Nadima Agard, Native American artist. You can find her work at nadimaagard.com. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website of bahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel, A Baha'i Perspective. You can find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i Faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. The photograph I see Comes alive so easily And tells me of a life That was so pure He would never turn Away from anyone And the love in his eyes Is so real Suffered all his life to show us how to be free. He could always love his enemy. And through the worst of trials, he could always smile and lift the heart of every friend up so high. Wash away his fear for a while He could understand the secrets we defend And make it feel that living was worthwhile
nature's most mighty grace have been infused into all created things. It is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world To reconcile their differences and with perfect unity And peace abide beneath the shadow of the tree of his name And loving kindness It is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world To reconcile their differences and with perfect unity To this newborn child Through whom the face of creation Hath been wreathed in smiles All dominion Longeth to this newborn child Through whom the face of creation Hath been wreathed in smiles And the trees have swayed And the oceans have surged And the mountains have taken flight All dominion Belongeth to this newborn child face of creation hath been wreathed in smiles and the trees have swayed and the oceans have surged and the mountains have taken flight and the trees 
have swayed and the oceans have surged and the mountains have taken flight. Praise be to Thee, O my merciful Lord, for remembering me. I bear witness that Thou art potent to do as Thou pleasest. No God is there but Thee. Praise be to Thee, O my merciful Lord, for remembering me. I bear witness that Thou art potent to do as Thou pleasest. No God is there but Thee.
through thy love, through thy love, oh. Through thy love, through thy love, oh. oh. Bind together all the hearts and join in a chord of souls. Oh Lord, make all of mankind. As the stars that shine from the same sky, and as the perfect fruits that are growing high, through Thy love, through Thy love, oh, through Thy love, through Thy love, oh, oh. let us bind together all the hearts and join in a chord of souls. Exhilarate the spirits through the signs of sanctity. Make these faces radiant through thy love, through thy love, oh. Through thy love, through thy love, oh. If we bind together all the hearts and join in a so
like the all bountiful the all knowing the all wise thou verily art the all Sacrifice it all. 